Good evening and welcome to Discover Tinley for May. This month's show is going to concentrate heavily on the village government and the parts, couple parts of the village government that most of us as citizens in town have some contact with. Our first guest is Chief Robert Long, the Tinley Park Police Department. And uh, Chief, thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Everyone knows about that the police department exists. That's one problem you don't have as far as being seen and heard sometimes. Um, but not too many people really know how large the department is and what it consists of. Can you give us a little input on just how big Tinley is in that? Well, the police department consists of 31 full-time employees, sworn employees, counting myself. It's broken down into four divisions, the patrol, support, communications, investigations, and crime prevention as a bureau. The uh, department also consists of seven full-time uh, female employees, radio dispatchers, clerks, typists, and uh, secretaries. We have uh, 27 reserve police officers. We have 13 crossing guards, seven part-time radio dispatchers, part-time dog catcher, a uh, part-time commuter uh, enforcement officer that checks our commuter lots. So totally under the police department, counting all full-time and part-time personnel, there's 87. It's quite a and, size. Uh, yes, there's quite a few people. And that, um, are there any women police patrol officers at this point? Uh, full-time, no. We've had three in the past. Uh, the last one just went full-time police officer with Orland Park, City mm. of Orland Park. Okay. There's one presently now undergoing her physical and in-depth psychological to be a full-time officer for our department. I understand that the training is fairly severe. Um, you don't just walk in and apply and get the job. I was at the high school one time when one of the officers was running a group of recruits through, I think, a physical endurance test, or at least it looked like that. I know I wouldn't have passed that part of it. What are the requirements? If someone's interested in becoming a police officer, as opposed to, I'm assuming the other jobs are civil service, the secretarial yes. or that, uh, a police officer or a radio dispatcher would come under civil service civil also. Service also. All full-time employees of the village are civil service, mm -hmm. with the exception of appointed, appointed personnel. What the, kind of requirements? Is there an age and? Well, from, yes. From 21 to 35 uh, is the age limit. That has been contested in court now. Uh, to 35, they want them to be older. They have 27... I want to interrupt. That doesn't mean that it, once you get past 35, you can't be a police officer. It does until the current court case is settled. Uh, well, if a, is an the, officer is on the force and... Oh, no. That's that just means hiring. for hiring age. Hiring purposes only, yes. Early retirement. <laughs> right. The, uh, you have to have uh, at least a minimum high school education. You're 2070 to corrected to 2020 vision. You have to uh, be in good physical condition. Mm -hmm. And you have to move within the village because of the residency rule within a year from completion of the probationary period. Uh, the portion you watched at the high school is the physical agility test. You pass that, you know, then you go on to the next stage, which then we have the physical examination. Mm -hmm. uh, right after that exam, you take the written test. If you pass that, then there's the uh, physical examination from the hospital and x-rays. <coughs> we have uh, an in-depth psychological and polygraph examination. Uh, that's quite extensive. Uh, and you actually background. get people applying to go through all that. Yes. Um, uh, the requirements for, let's say, radio operator, radio or secretary of that in the department would be the same or would not be as stringent? No, it is not as stringent because of the job requirements. Uh, they just need to have a high school education, you know, and be in good physical condition. Uh, the dispatchers, radio dispatchers, have to do some typing, mm -hmm. and uh, they also serve as matrons, and that turns a lot of them away from accepting the position because they don't want to search other females. I guess I could understand that. Uh, <laughs> sure. 
but that's part of part of the thing that comes with the job. Um, what uh, do you have a lot of people who want to be officers? Is there a waiting list? Or? Yes, um, we'll be giving another examination this summer for uh, full-time personnel, police officers. Uh, we had one three years ago, and there were 35 names of people who qualified on the list, and we had. Uh, like 384, I believe, applicants who uh, tried for it. But wow. 35 made the list, and of those 35, we've hired one. So in three years? In three years. And that, that by making the list, they have completed all of those requirements? No, just passed the physical, physical agility and the written. And they're still only halfway there once they get on the list. Uh, one third, yes. We see a lot of squad cars in the village. Um, I see them parked in private driveways and up at the shopping mall with not necessarily a uniformed officer driving, or, you know, he's not in uniform, he's driving. You know, there's a squad car program, as I understand it. Could yes, you talk about that a little? Uh, it's a personal squad car program. We started in 1975. Uh, it, it gives the officer the opportunity to use the vehicle off-duty to... Uh, take his wife to the store or his kids to the show or whatever. You see a police vehicle in a mall shopping lot, you don't know where the officer is or whether he's on duty or not. He, uh, technically, he is per se on duty. He has to, uh, you know, have his weapon and his identification, everything with him. At the time, he does respond to accidents if they're severe until the uniform patrol traffic division gets there. Uh, he does render a lot of assistance, but uh, he's responsible for the squad car. No one else can drive it. That way we maintain the vehicle for a minimum of a three-year period. Mm -hmm. And most of the time they'll go like into four years. So it's cut down on our vehicle maintenance tremendously and in actuality saves money. Has the visibility reduced crime? Has there been any no, studies we, as to whether it has helped? We like to think so, but there's actually no way to measure deterrence. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Especially with the growth that we've that's correct. In 75, like I said, when we started the program, uh, the village was still in a tremendous growth pattern. Yeah. Tremendous growth pattern. Yes. All Slowed over the a city, little now. As a matter but fact, yes. But we hope that uh, with the re recession over, that it'll pick back up now. Okay. There are limits on the squad cars, I understand it. They on can't. Distance. On distance out of the village. Correct. A mile and a half is the far as they can go out of the village limits. Okay. There's so many things that the police department is responsible for, but what are some of the smaller items that people can call the police department for, a site of non-emergency type basis? Well, we get a tremendous amount of calls for vehicle lockouts, uh, which we use to a tool called the Slim Jim to help you, assist you into your car. The only thing we frown on and rather not do and advise the uh, citizens electric car doors uh, that's one electric the, locks are no good for if you lock yourself out you're in trouble well we don't want to damage the lock because it's considerably expensive to be repaired and uh, we don't want to be paying for it so uh, we would rather not do that mm -hmm. we also have vacation checks for homes whenever you're on vacation we have a tremendous amount of school programs as you're aware of the uh, some of the program mm -hmm. for not only grade school but high school mm -hmm. There's been a lot of concern lately, and I understand you have a program going to fingerprint small children. Yes, we've been doing that for approximately a year, year and a half, um, from two years old, a bare minimum, you know, up to approximately 16. The, uh, and that goes into the computer? No. No. Those, all the information is contained on the card, the fingerprints and everything else is given back to the parents. We do not retain anything. But that would be a help if a child was missing. That's the uh, primary thrust of the program. We don't keep mm -hmm. anything on the child. Okay. I know there's so much more we could spend the time talking about, but we are limited on time. We thank you for coming tonight, and we hope that by listening that you've gained an appreciation of some of the other things aside of the traffic tickets and uh, accident fender bender problems that the police locally take care of. Of course, they're always there by 911 for an emergency. And uh, we encourage you to 
use them on non-emergency situations if you have a problem, such as a car lockout or if you're going on vacation with the Vacation Watch program. I believe that you can be reached through 532-9111, yes, a non-emergency number. Thank you, Chief. It's been nice talking yes, with you appreciate it. tonight. We'd like to take a few minutes before our next guest to put in a very special plug for a very exciting and special event that Tinley Park has been fortunate to have uh, happening each Memorial Day weekend for the last few years. And with me tonight is Mr. Edward Trenick, Chairman of the Veterans Commission. Um, as we're talking about is the Memorial, I don't know if it's Memorial Day weekend or the official Memorial yeah, Day that's weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the cantonment. Would you like to just tell us basically what that is? Yeah, we, we have a weekend uh, set up. This is, I believe, our seventh one, and it's for the whole, entire family. It's at McCarthy Park, 169th and 80th Avenue. Uh, the price is very reasonable, nothing. And uh, it's a weekend that the whole family can really enjoy, bring the kids out. It's a learning experience, really, for uh, young and old. On Saturday, May the 26th, all day long, beginning at 9 o'clock, we're having the modern military come out, all branches of the service, with the various uh, pieces of equipment, uh, displays, etc. And we're also going to have our obstacle course for the kids. They're all going to get the uh, T-shirts for the various branches of service. And we're going to have competition between our police department and the uh, military on the obstacle course and also in pistol competition. So that's always quite exciting. It's going to be a full day all the way down the line and it will be topped off in the late afternoon by uh, a memorial ceremony with the military, the Legion, and the VFW participating. Uh, on that evening, Saturday evening, we're going to have our military ball at the Legion Hall. Very reasonable, $3 to get in and a, an evening of fun and enjoyment. The military will be wearing their uniforms. The uh, Civil War people will be wearing their uniforms from the era. So it's just going to be a great evening. Uh, and on uh, Sunday, the 27th, will be uh, the day for the uh, Civil War reenactors. We used to have a battle, the Battle of the North and South, but with the uh, park uh, being uh, built up as it is, it's almost an impossibility to have a full-fledged battle. So uh, we've changed the format somewhat, and we're calling it a Living History Weekend. It's a weekend where the entire family can come and talk to the reenactors. These are people who have studied the Civil War from head to toe. They know all the little angles about it. And when you go there, you will be talking to them, and they will be speaking to you uh, from those times of Civil War times. In, in other words, it's going to bring you right back into history. And they are going to have a, an authentic union camp. You, the sentry will uh, challenge you as you approach. And uh, you can ask the questions, whatever you want, and they will uh, uh, talk to you as if it were way back then. So this is going to be a, really a, a learning experience, and we certainly in, uh, invite the families, and, uh, mom and dad, and young and old, and all the kids to come out and learn with us, take a walk into history, uh, talk to the reenactors, and learn, learn a little bit about just what America is all about. Uh, learn a little bit about the history of this great country. And uh, this is all with the, uh, the compliments of our Veterans Commission. This is our seventh year, and we really enjoy doing it. Well, it sounds really terrific. And again, it's May 26th and May 27th. That's correct. And what time in the morning would it be starting? Uh, around 9 o'clock. Nine mm -hmm. o'clock to dusk? Uh, yeah, uh, in the late afternoon. And uh, also on uh, Memorial Day, on, on Sunday, the, uh, the reenactors will also have a memorial service, and they will be doing the firing with the volleys with their muskets. And so, so. Oh, terrific. Mm -hmm. And tickets for the military ball can be gotten through? You just buy them at the door. Terrific. Thank you for coming out and talking about it, and I encourage everyone to get out there, at if not both days, at least Sunday, because the black powder muskets and the Civil War reenactment is definitely worth the time out. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Our final guest this evening is probably the one person in this village who knows more about Tinley Park than anyone. And that's 
Frank William German, commonly known as Frank or Bill, to people who worked with him, our village clerk. Um, Frank and all village clerks have been honored this month by a resolution by the President of the United States declaring May 13th as Village Clerks or Municipal Clerks Week. We're changed from village to municipal. Frank, how long have you been the clerk of the village in Tinley? Since uh, October of 1971, after Frank Jeffords retired, I was a trustee and then I resigned and then was appointed to fill in the vacancy. Then I've been elected since. Mm -hmm. So it's been about th uh, 14 years, close. That's a long time to serve. Yes. It seems to me that whenever the commissions or anyone gets involved with the village, somehow or another, we have to come to you for help or questions, or you always know the answers. Just what does the term clerk and how does it fit into our village government? All right, the word clerk has a, an old history. It's actually in the Bible, in the uh, story of St. Paul in Ephesus. It uh, mentions of a clerk who stopped a, uh, a riot situation. It's in the Bible, so hmm. the clerk. And then and through the mid, uh, mid uh, medieval times in England, the clerk became, the word came from the wor uh, word cleric. But most clerics were the uh, most trained people in the community. And they were also, in the Greek time, they were the one who read the proclamations out loud in the open. In the medieval times, through the history of England, uh, the cleric became clerk. Now, in England, I was there just this past year, they're called solicitors. But the terminology has been handed down with our American history. Right. It's one of the oldest of the offices in uh, local government. Well, it seems that that's the one office that takes care of business. Yes. Um, the elected officials all have their roles that they play, but when something needs to be get done, it's the clerk's office that takes care of business. How does the clerk's office, okay, I know we get our village stickers and our pay our fines and pay our water bills and that through your office, but what are some of the other general functions of the office of clerk? Well, uh, if, if I'm looking at the, the local area, uh, I'm responsible for the collection of monies from water bills and all that, and that's turned over into the treasury and deposited in the bank. Uh, also, I must be present at all the board meetings, and I'm, I'm a keeper of the journal, which are the minutes that I brought here. I'm also the keeper of the seal by statute. These are positions that spell out. I do not have a vote on the board. Not even in the present. case of a tie? No, no. That's purely the mayor or president in the case mm -hmm. and the trustee. But the clerk also serves many other functions. He, he tends to be the information center of the municipality. Uh, we can look at it in a sense that it's a kaleidoscopic job and I look at it as a prism that the citizen coming to the clerk's office getting some information by way of the board and the reaction from the board and the ordinances to the citizens. So I become the prism or the focal point of the community. I think there's a part of that prism you've forgotten that's a very real service that your office provides in as a type of information and referral service for more than just the village government. Yes. I know that yeah. uh, if someone calls with a problem of any type, you try and find at least somewhere where they can be helped. That's true, and that's the, um, the one thing about a municipal clerk. He has to have compassion. He has to be personable, understanding, a good listener, because sometimes what people are requesting is not really what they're after. You have to be able to determine what really are they asking. And you can only do it by asking questions from what they say. Many times people don't know where to go, who to turn to. And we try in our best to uh, give them that information. How uh, is the position of village clerk the same in every municipality, whether no. it's a village or a city? or? That's why I say the word generic is the same. 
but there are in Indiana, for instance, there are clerk treasurers, like there are some clerk t collectors, like in my case. There are clerk uh, administrators. The whole office is administrative. You go into Connecticut and they uh, are recorder of deeds and of uh, plats, but they all serve the same function, but they're named differently. In Texas, they're called secretaries. So you go from state to state and they're different. You go into Canada, and uh, they're uh, more like managers. Now, if I remember correctly, you were just recently elected to a national or international position. I just returned a short while ago. I'm on a goals committee for the International Institute of Municipal Clerks. And this is the function, getting this proclaimed by the mm -hmm. House and Senate. Mm -hmm. This is the proclamation that President uh, Reagan signed was passed both by the House and by the Senate to, to highlight the position of the municipal clerks throughout Canada and the United States. So, for instance, accurate recording, careful safeguarding, prompt retrieval of public records are the vital functions of the municipal clerk's office. So we were instrumental in that. On the goals committee, we're setting our goals at what is a municipal clerk today and where do we project it to be in the future? We're looking. We spent two full days in Rochester. It inevitably is going to come down to a college education. It's going to be a requirement with a degree in business administration or in public administration with variations. Variations could be, their variations could be uh, Parliamentary procedure, psychology, communications of all types, so that a municipal clerk would have the ability to speak to you, communicate with the public. Well, so that's where the ultimate goal is going to it's be. It's turning into a definitely professional. <coughs> yes, more professional um, than ever. Operation. In the 14 years that you've served Tinley Park, I know there have been a lot of changes. Um, mm -hmm. That's about how long I've been living in the village. But you brought with you tonight something that I think is fascinating. Can you this, talk about this a little? As a keeper of the record, you also become the historian of the past, the present, and the future. This is the original document when the village became a village back in June 28th of 19, 1898, 92. 1892. When the citizens of this community were known as Bremen at that time, New Bremen, voted as to whether they wanted to become a village or not. Fifty-eight people voted at the Rock Island Station, which was on the north side of the tracks, not where, where it is Where the current present. parking lot is. Right. Thirty-four voted for the village incorporation, and twenty-four voted against. So officially, the birth date of the municipality is June 28th, 1892. And then when the World's Fair comes to Chicago, we'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary. Our centennial anniversary. Now, this book, are all handwritten, it represents the minutes of the boards from 1892 through 1908. But to show you the change that's going on with the advent of growth, had 300 people back in 1900, the first census. Today, we're about 28,000. So here I brought a book. It's single, ta uh, single page, single space, and these are actual recording of the minutes for one year. So you see the difference. Gone from 16 years in handwritten to one year, one year in type and typed. And typed and bound. And these are all kept in the safe and a permanent record. That's why the village clerk becomes technically the historian of the community. Well, I imagine looking through those would be fascinating. We could yeah, probably do a whole show on yeah, that. Yeah, like terminology that people don't understand today, like calaboose. Booth. We had a lamplighter in this community with gas lights on the, what was known as Bachelor's Grove. It's as Oak, Oak Park, Park, Oak Park, Park Avenue. Avenue today. Right. So, those are the terms that go. 
Well, maybe we can uh, do a show in the future with some of the changes in terminology and some of the did you know when. Yes. Um, we thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. And for anybody, well, anytime you go into the village clerk's office, but especially the week of May 13th, make a point to tell them thank you for the job they're doing because it's a underpaid, underrewarded, but extremely necessary job. Thank you for joining us tonight. And if your organization or group has information would like to be highlighted on Discover Tinley, please contact myself, Rita Broad, care of the Human Resources Commission at the Village Hall. Thank you and good night. Until next time, Discover Tinley.